Confusion Bureau, United We Stand, by Arcade Striker JK5, Epilogue. Megan, Mike, Michelle, and Daniel stood at the edge of the crater that their home and neighborhood once occupied. It had been two days since the barrier had been destroyed, and new equestrians and faces stopped. Soldiers, engineers, scientists, and others moved about. Some inside the crater itself, but most around it. They all kept their distance from the Richards family, letting them have some time. Danielle slowly shook her head, waving a hand at the crater. Well, this is still just... unreal. Still can't believe our home's gone. Can't believe the whole neighborhood's gone! She dropped her arm back down to her side, as if she had no more energy. She still craned her head to look up at Megan, standing right behind her. Mommy, baby, where are we going to sleep tonight? Megan and Mike exchanged the look. Uncle Danny and Aunt Mally have offered their houses for us to stay until we get something a bit more permanent. We should be fine there, Michelle. Megan said, placing a hand on her shoulder. Danielle rubbed her chin. Although the worst comes to worst, you could come to Equestria. Mom and Dad could stay at Sweet Apple Acres, and my Michelle could camp out at Super Cute Corner with Pan Pumpkin Cake. Blakey would love to have a third key to babysit. She held up her hands, even as Megan and Mike got her there. Kidding! Kidding! Well, mostly. I mean, worst comes to worst. Katie's farmhouse survived all right. Talk with Tessa after she came back from Earth. Is she your father wouldn't mind sitting there if you have to? Megan's Ralph furrow. You sure they're all right? Last I checked, there's craters all over the fields. Mike started. Honey, it's Katie Hager. There are always craters all over his fields. He'll clear his throat. Ahem. So, how much stuff did you have removed from the house for the move? I think you said most of it. Mike nodded, laying out of breath. We were going to start preparations for the move in the house to his new location. So just about everything, except some old sleeping bags, was in a storage facility outside of town. By some miracle, just about everything we owned survived. I think his gaze stretched to the crater. Yeah. We were lucky. Everyone else just about lost everything. Michelle craned her head looked up at Megan and Mike. Well, I uh, don't need any of my old toys. You can just give them to anyone who wants them. Megan patted Michelle on the shoulder. That's very sweet of you, honey. You sure? Michelle not. Yeah. She grinned. I can give my dolls to Otis. Megan's jaw worked for a bit. Well, I suppose this is the thought that counts. Moving caught her eye. She turned as a barkeep approached her family. A little seems surrounded by motorcycles. Ah! I think we got company. The motorcade slowed, stopping a few feet for the Richards. One of the motorcycles dismounted and opened a door in the limousine. Only President Abernathy and several Secret Service agents to step out. The agents flanked clean as he approached the family. Mr. Richards? Mrs. Richards? He said, bowing his head to Megan. Can I speak with you? Megan and Mike exchanged the look. The two nodded to each other. Megan looked at Clayton. Of course, Mr. Bracey. Thank you. She flashed a small smile. It's good to see you again. Clayton returned a smile. Oh, uh, yes. Your backyard. During our first official meeting with Celestia and Luna. He waved a hand at the crater, smile fading and falling away. I know it's a cold comfort, but I wish to express my sorrow at the events that transpired with my solemn word that this area will be rebuilt. Those driven out by Neo Equestria's invasion will have their homes restored as best as we can. As soon as we can. That includes your house, too. Albeit, it'll be in a new location, expanded into the plan embassy. My cat smiled. I think I might be able to help with that bit. I got the blueprints for the place, trucked away at a ha warehouse the rest of our cell set. Make it look to Mac. That'll keep you busy for a bit. She then looked back to clean. Thank you, Mr. President. She paused. If I may ask, do you know what will happen to the Queen? That fair? Clayton hesitated. It's a bit up in the air at the moment. I'll be going with some others to New Equestria to meet with their new heads of government. Till then, I can't say anything concrete. Megan nodded. Well, that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. President. Clayton nodded to her. I can tell you, though. I will be awarding you the Presidential Medal of Freedom right before you receive the Congressional Gold Medal and the Medal of Valor. Mounting area. After all you've done, you more than earned it. 
Make his eyes wide slightly. Ah, uh, thank you, sir. She swallowed blood slightly. I was just glad to help out. Daniel grinned. Let it go, Mo. Michelle leaned back, looked up to Megan. Mo was even more than a hear of the four. Mike grabbed an arm around Megan in a hug and kissed her on the cheek. I'll hear her. He said, grin. Megan lightly bad at him. I'll hush you three. Nathan walked out to Clayton. Leaned in close and whispered to the president in hushed tones. Clayton nodded to him, then looked to the Richards. I do apologize, but I do have a meeting to attend. It was good to see you again. You see, at least Clayton gives out a good reward. Not a gift certificate to freaking Olive Garden. Well, you watched the sight movie one time, and you are really going to bring in the references. I like that movie. General Lemo must stop to look back. You know, I found a whole Magne myths built up around you to be somewhat interesting. You have a bit before. But now, I think I'm seeing why you were so venerated and mythologized. With that, he turned to walk back to the limo. Megan rocked slightly on her heels. I'm not sure that bodes well poorly for me in the future. They all her head back and forth. A little above? I'll take it. Gerald Lennox, Commodore Fairborn, and Chief Master Sergeant Wielder stood in front of Mega Dunes inert Cassies. Constructed con vehicles wor workers swarmed around a behemoth. Appearing as little more than ants compared to it. Legs rocked back and forth on his heels and waved a hand at it. So, Commodore, what did Ambassador Hot Rod say about this thing? Marissa looked at Zoe. Sergeant, please relay Hot Rod's exact words to us as he stood there. Zoe nodded. Yes, ma'am. She cleared her throat. Ahem. <clears throat> then turned and held up both arms towards the Mega Doom. Holy scrap, that thing's huge! She said. Her voice almost taking on a mechanical echo as I returned to the Oh, yeah. We'll help you rebuild it. Get it back on his feet. Yes, tracks. Oh, you know what I mean, Marissa. Yeah, it'll be fun. Nice point to Sully finished speaking. Thank you, Sergeant. He went to Omega Doom and then leaned forward, focusing on Sergeant. Sergeant, how did you do the floods? Sully paused. Practice, General. A lot of throat lozenses. Lions barked to laugh. <laughs> well, okay. Then whoever I Marissa slowly nodded. Do you know, General? He pointed to my Mega Dunes midsection. One lucky break we have is that there's an actual control room in the chest. It's scaled for mid sized Cybertronians, but we should be able to downsize it for our use. Nice grin. Can't wait to take a ride in it. He paused. Wait, what goes into the gas tank? Aerojon? Fusion? Souls of the Dam? Where's the glass of Sully? Sorry, Sid. Sully slits out a data pad over a pocket on her right thigh. Touch the screen a few times. Standard Air John, with backup fusion reactors. I hesitate to say this, but we shouldn't have any real problem with that. Let's lean forward with her. I'll hold you to that, Sergeant. So when are we going to get Valkyries? In class, Marissa. Well, keep me informed on the repairs and fitting, Commodore. He stays to lose with her before about facing walking off. Marissa turned to Zoe. I hope you didn't talk Murphy back there, Sergeant. I'm looking forward to taking a ride in this thing, too. So he half smiled. Murphy and I are old friends, Commodore. I think he knows enough to stay away this time. A large hole in space opened on the plains of Neo Equestria, at the front gates of Carillon. A small convoy of vehicles drove out of it, consisting of a red and silver tractor trailer, a limo surrounded by motorcycles and a few other vehicles. It bellowed down towards Princesses Luna and Canids, current and newest rulers. The convoy slowed to a halt. The tractor trailer cab to test itself with the trailer. It transformed into Optimus Prime. Oh, so the convoy did slow to a halt. 24! 24 chapters! And you finally, finally made a joke about Optimus' Japanese name! I held it in all this time! While the limo doors were open, and President Aphrodite, Chip Chase, and Dr. Who stepped out. Finally, the trailer's back door opened, allowing Princess Celestia and Preceptor to exit and join the others. Secret agents surrounded Clayton and Chip, weapons in their holsters, but their hands near their grips. Both Luna and Cain's bowed their heads. We thank you for coming here, Luna said, glancing up. We have been brief on who would be coming here, and time is of the essence, so we may skip formal introductions. Clayton nodded. I would like to wear you think, Luna. 
He had to left hand, opened it up, and pulled out a folder with a sheet of papers inside its folds. This is a list of everyone who was converted into a new fold brought here. They are to be located and retrieved as soon as possible for return to Earth. You have the means of turning them back into mind control, your false list you had over them. Liz Horn glowed. The folder floated up and over to her, opening up in front of her muscle. We have already sent out God's ponies to strike them down, President Abernathy. She looked over her shoulder. Open the gates! Cantalot's main gates opened. A large group of ponies walked out, flanked by two large of Gunner's ponies. All of them looked physically healthy, but their expresses were haunted. They gazed low on the grass beneath their hooves. Please kill these sights. Oh my god. He turned around towards the convoy. Give them to the ambulances! He said, tapping a finger at the group. Oh, a full head cat, you hear? I want them taken care of. He spun around on a heel, walked towards the ponies, the secret service surrounding him. One of the ponies, a nerf pony mare, stopped him again. She so straightened to attention and brought a right foreleg of salute. Mr. President, she said with a shaky voice, Sergeant Rebecca Winchester. Most of the other ponies snapped to attention, saluting the President as they could. Clayton instinctively straightened to attention and returned to salute. At ease, Sergeant. At ease, all of you. We're going to get you help. We have got an antidote to the potion. We can make you human again and block any lingering mind control. Once dying, approached an ancient smith. Smith, good to see you again. I'm afraid I'll be taking a leave of absence for a bit. Smith looked down, eyes widening behind his glasses, his face contorted to a mixture of shock and horror. Roger? He had afraid that. Roger Jefferson nodded. It's me, Smith. My head is mostly in the right place again. Guess whatever the Matrix and the Elements of Harmony did severed our hold, and that Don Deplicator had drawn us. Clayton walked over to the pair. Roger, have you encountered other new foals, ones not from our Earth? Roger glanced down at the grass, his brow furrowed. No, I care a lot, no. But before that, I'm not sure, sorry. Mr. President, the memory is slightly muddled. A pair of nurses ran out to the group. One stopped in front of Clayton, bowing his head. Mr. President, I apologize, but we have to get Mr. Jefferson back in order to do a full checkup and accurate hit count. Clayton sharply nodded and patted the younger man on the shoulder. Of course, of course. His eyes followed Roger as he led off by the young nurse. They'll take good care of you, Roger. They'll all take good care of you. Luna and Keen spat their heads. I know they are fairly empty, but I still offer my apologies on what has happened, Luna finally said. Celestia nodded. As long as the air sits for your apologies, it is a good start, princess. Clayton slid a data pad out of his socket and tapped the screen. You have 72 ponies from your reality, as well as three of the Autobots in custody. We'll make arrangements for them to be returned to you in two days. Keynes leaned back slightly. Some of the mechanical men survived? Are they dangerous? Optimus spoke up. They surrender, and I do not condone summary execution of prisoners of war. We have agreed to have all but the most basic self-defense systems removed, in exchange for a safe passage to your view in question. Luna cocked her head to the side. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Prime. We'll take them back onto those conditions, she nickered. <laughs> I swear, Celestia, what you did here, it'll be decades before you end any measure of forgiveness. Clayton stared at her. Princess, I hate to break it to you, but your Celestia will not be returned to you. Nor will Captain Armor, or your verses of the Bearers of the Elements of Harmony. You will be brought to Tyler and made to answer for her crimes. Gates' his eyes wide. Are you... you're serious? Celestia spoke up. What she did was beyond the pale, Luna. She and the others must answer for their crimes. You and Celestia froze discord in stone for his atrocities, did you not? Luna slowly spoke. We did, yes. He gave Celestia the Tartarus stand warning that led us down this path. Plain's mouth said to a grim line, and she swallowed whatever he said like a fish about to be reeled in. He held up his hand. This isn't negotiable, princess. You will not be released back into your request yet. They shall stand trial for their transgressions and serve whatever sentence passed on to them. Lil's eyes darkened. She finally closed him and hung her head. Small rivers of tears dripped down from beneath her eyelids. Her ears folded flat against her skull. Keynes reached over and gently struck the wing down Luna's back. She looked to Clayton. 
It's pressed as neutral as possible. We understand, Mr. President. It will be difficult for Luna to accept this, even after everything has happened. Luna sucked in her breath and opened her eyes. She looked down at Clayton, finally speaking. Well, I understand, President Abbott. We do not object or attempt to hinder you in any way, she swallowed. Would it be possible for her to see her at least once? Clayton grimaced. Step to his right and wave Perceptor, Ship, and the Doctor forward, gentle beings. The Doctor cleared his throat. Ahem! <coughs> Why, Slippity? Within two months, all travel and contact between your reality and us must permanently cease and decease. If not, there will be a catastrophic consequences for all three realities. Luna and Keen stared at him. Are you serious? Luna asked. She denied. He is, Presence. What your Celestia did was outrageously insane. It damaged the missile barriers. They had to heal and reinforce themselves. The doctor nickered. <laughs> they basically took a chainsaw to a tissue paper. If we don't break contact with you, the dimensional barriers would collapse. And that would be a fine kettle of fish. It still won't be any kettle of fish because the constituent particles will have been scattered to the wind. But his eyes wide. Oh no, this is a disaster. She shook her head. No, no, you cannot break contact with us. You be condemning millions, probably beating us to death. Ian spoke up. She's not being hyperbolic either. Our entire agricultural system is either on the verge of collapse or has collapsed. We have heard reports of widespread food sources all throughout Equestria. We haven't had any riots yet. He rubbed the brains of his nose. I have a feeling this was happening. Celestia cared to face the three scientists. Are you completely sir? Is there no way to keep contact going so we can help them? Perceptor spoke up. We are completely so, Princess. Continue travel be all two will regain and destroy their dimensional stability. Gaze looked to him. What about travel between your two realities? Has that been affected? Perceptor shook his head. No, Your Highness. Travel between our realities will not be affected. Gaze's ears folded down her head. No small miracle there. Sound of ground. She dug a furrow to the dirt. Too much, you said, Doctor? There must be some help you we can give you before then. You said your agricultural system is collapsing? We could provide fertilizer, maybe some food shipments. Clay looked to Celestia, did to Luna Cants. I'll see what Earth can do to help as well. We should be able to get some relief shipments to you before contact has to be broken. I don't know how much, but we can. Optimus read his faceplate. Cybertron should be able to supply you self-repairing farming equipment to help, along with other low-maintenance, high-endurance devices. In the meantime, we also got these. He turned and pointed at his trailer. Internal machinery groaned and whined as it split along a seam, opened up, revealing racks upon racks of files containing processes. There are thousands of files of an antidote to new vault poison. We could soon, it will really revert a new vault back into their human form. And mitigate some of the physical damage that has occurred to them through malnutrition and starvation. It's not perfect, but I can hopefully help. Luna leaned forward, her horn lit up. She produced a file out of one of the rags and over to her, bobbed up and down her telekinesis. How did you produce this? All the vials are posted all locked in our vaults, and we plan on destroying them. Presenter spoke up. Our forces managed to capture numerous vials of the poison. After a thorough analysis, we were able to discover the chemical compounds. A thematic spells used in the original potion and create an antidote. It's easier to produce them than reverse and engineer the potion itself. Celestia walked up to Luna. My faithful student Twilight Sparkle and 199 other unicorns are at Autobot's city as we speak, producing the antidote and getting it ready for transport here. As Optimus said, it's not a cure-all, but it should help. Luna floated the vial back to the rack and carefully slid into its hole. We will take all the help we can get. We do thank you for it. So at the kids, get fancy pots of the other beer clots and coffee. Lots of coffee. While the air is talk, the nurse walked up to Clayton. Mr. President, we did head count. He said, we triple checked. Everyone's accounted for. Clayton let out a breath. He didn't even know he was holding. Oh, thank you. Risa patted the nurse on her shoulders. Thank you. Nurse nodded. You're welcome, Mr. President. We'll be moving them back to Earth so they can be cured. Clayton nine. Good, good. 
Good. Get them the best care, you hear me? The nurse has nodded. He turned to Optimus' trailer, and the group scattered around it. If you'll excuse me. The nurse stepped back and made his way back to the smaller herd of new falls and headed to vehicles. Clayton, meanwhile, walked up to Optimus' side. He clapped his hands together. All right. We've got a lot to do, a little time to do it. Can you feel me on what you discuss, please? Onslaught glanced around the hallway. He blasted off Vortex and Brawl were being let down. The quartet were on New Voss, Starscream's main base of operations, in the heart of his so-called New Decepticon Empire. Three solar cycles ago, he and the Combaticons, along with the Sunticons, had been ambushed on some nameless moon by a large force of Autobots. While the Sunticons fought and died, the Combaticons surrendered and remained functional. Their laser cores had been removed from their old bodies and placed into stasis on Garrus 9, where they would be remain for another 10,000 years. I unleashed until Starscream and their human pets rebelling some invasion from another reality. Onslaught Muse as their guide, Ruckus, led them to a set of double doors. All four had their laser cores applied in new chassis, albeit ones not designed for warfare. Thank you for taking us here, Ruckus, Onslaught said, sketching a bow. Ruckus glanced at Maru's shoulder. Hey, no problem, I'll fire the job! He raised a hand to the control panel, but paused. Hey, this is gonna sound nuts, but Starscream actually seems to know what he's doing with this whole leader thing he's got going on. Brawl banged the hand, sorry. Ruckus, get a load of volume. We got civilian grade auto receptors in these tin cans the Autobots so graciously stuck our laser cores in. Vortex 9, you could be worse. We could still be stuck on Garrus 9 in limbo for another 9,097 solar cycles. Ruckus ignored him and opened the door to lead him inside. Onslaught's optics took the room. It was large, some decorations here and there. The deceptive brand snapped on several walls and banners hanging from the ceiling. But overall, it tended more towards function. Three of the four walls were nothing more than gigantic view screens, while the fourth was a window that looked over the city proper. Several freestanding and recharging stasis were scattered about, along with racks of laser rifles and other assorted weapons. In the stair, taking most of the floor space, was a large circular table surrounded by chairs. A holographic projector was embedded in the stair, currently lit up and sold local solar systems surrounding New Vols. Standing his hands crossed behind his back was Starscream. Shockwave, Swindle, and Soundwave stood by him as he pointed to a hologram. What about Sister 25 Alpha? Starscream asked. Shockwave head tilted up. Sing the optic flash. That system is already being claimed by Nobles, he reported. Onslaught leaned forward, fingers working. He waved for the explosion. He waved for the screeching, for the temper tantrum that was sure to erupt. Scar screen chuckled lightly. Oh, yes, you're right. How silly of me not to notice the proximity to Neblos. He looked over at Onslaught. Aren't telling why? Ah, the Gabanti cause return! He walked over, extending his hand. Onslaught, good to see you with a body again. Onslaught looked down at Starscream's hand. He looked back up. Head craning as Starscream was now about head taller to him. Well, it seems this is the second time I owe you for regular service for Stasis Lock in my prison. He crashed Starscream's hand, pumped it twice. Thank you. Starscream nodded to him. You're welcome. Lead to his friend, looked to Vortex, blast off and brawl. Good to see you three. I'm looking you all to the new Decepticon Empire. Let's hope for Decepticons and Scouts you wide. Brawl raised a hand. So, what is this exactly? Guessing we're not doing some long term plan for going against the Autobots of humans? Is this a. a tenement government? Starscream nodded to him. Pompous Cersei cans from a few seconds earlier are gone. You are correct, Brawl. He fed to some gas. I was a scientist before the war. Before Megatron started his little uprising against the functionalist infested Senate. I know how to look at raw numbers and data a cookie conclusion. Though Primus knows it's been too long since I really done that. He turned around and walked up to the table's edge. He tapped a control panel on a star map to change to the image of Cybertron. The Autobots have won! Cybertron is fully energized, operating a star, which means they both run out of energy anytime soon. Vectrex Sigma is active again! 
A spot to ignite all across the planet. Leading contact in of all four to Optimus Prize's banner. If Field Jack and Perceptor had developed that method for challenging the energy from what two or more laser cores into a new core, just starting a new spark of life. He chuckled. <laughs> and should I even get into their galleries across the galaxy? Human, Nebulons, Tarakians, Titans, and Primus knows who knows how many I can list off. Pratt Brawl chuckled. <laughs> and meanwhile, we Decepticons don't have any potential allies or any way to increase our population. Shockwave spoke up. I'm afraid you're an incorrect of both crowns, Brawl. Although, to be fair, your conclusions are based on data tracks that were relevant when your laser call was removed in 2009. In standard two weeks, we shall be sending a delegation of Cybertron to sign what is being called the Treaty of Iacon. There, we shall sign a formal peace treaty with Cybertron, Earth, Nebulus, and our allies. We shall be recognized as a sovereign nation state, allowed to claim nine solar systems as our own territory, and given an amnesty for any past transgressions against them. Starscreen smirked. As for repopulating our depleted ranks, I managed to place a dick color spy in Autobot intelligence. Between the information he's passed to us and our own ingenuity, we've been able to replicate the process. Brawl leaned forward, objects Brighton. You've been able to replicate the process. Pass says Starscream. You created new life. Starscream nodded, expressing now serious. We have, Brawl. We started out small, simply due to our sources of resources. They're human-sized. About the size of the inhabitants of Divison, one of the Autobot refugee colonies we discussed earlier. Each one transforms into half a vehicle, i.e. the front or back. The constructor car supplying the lesser core energy. The gust of a smirk returned. You'll be meeting them soon enough. Onslaught chuckled. <laughs> I look forward to it. He said to his right and walked past the star screen. No, do you make a guardian in the room? He says he pressed Swindle, Vortex, Brawl, and blast off trail behind him. Swindle held his hands up a few steps as his teammate approached. Whoa, whoa, slow down, guys! Okay, I'm very sorry about what taking place in the stasis locker, Garrus 9, but there's... Brawl spoke up. We're not angry, you Swindle. You're right. We still so gone with you when you left Galatron's faction. Blast off spread his arms out. Indeed. If we had... We wouldn't have had our laser core sucked into these red sacks from a huge car lot. Seriously, I can't even break out of orbit in this thing. Vortex looked to him. You got a bad. I don't even have an airborne alt mode. At least you can fly. Onslaught turned around. Grabaticons, attention! He waited for them to snap before looking back to Swindle. Brawl is right. None of us hold any animosity towards you, Swindle. We're not even angry with ourselves for not going with you or anything. Swindle grinned. All right, then. That's really mature of you guys. I'm glad to hear this, really. Brawl Sugar said, Don't make us regret by going with being salt on us, Swindle. Starscream walked over and irritated to be between himself and Swindle. As newsy as this would be to watch, we have business. If you follow me, I have a surprise for you. With that, he turned and walked to the door. Combatant following him out of the room, eventually the building itself. He led them across to another building, this one more utilitarian looking and larger than the previous one. He walked into the larger, taking up almost the entire interior building of itself. Where stasis lined the walls, while machinery hung from girders mounted to the ceiling. Other pieces of equipment were seemingly scattered all over the floor. Six human-sized Decepticons could be seen working around a set of CR chambers near the back of the building. Starscreen clapped his hands together as he led the big cons over. Alright, I believe Constructor Squad, line up! He waited for the six to put down their tools and form a loose line before continuing. May I introduce Stonecruncher, Escafita, Gurret, Knockout, Sleds, and Hammer! Brawl looked down at him and waved. Hi there, cute little guys. Sleds raised a fist and shook it at Brawl. Cute! Cute! I'll disassemble your drive train and strip your gears, you call me cute! Brawl tossed his head back horrible. I was like, can I keep him? Starscream raised his arm and shot off a low power blast from his arm can. 
Cut the static, he said, pointing to the Alcos. Gamma! I've been at the CR team as it shows the competitive cards the surprise I got for them! Here it's also a salute. You got it! He walked over to a small pedestal next to the chambers and pressed two buttons, then pulled down a lever. In front of the CR chamber split along a seam, a swung moment. Eternal light switched on, illuminating four inert forms inside. The Patagons stared at him. Onslaught walked forward and looked at the lifeless optic centers of the largest one there. Impressive, he finally said. He looked at Starscream. For us? Starscream grinned. Of course! Although I do appreciate your tactical subroutines, I think you'll agree it's being better if you can actually fight, too. You know, to us, right? You don't worry, Blastoff. Not only can your new body achieve orbit, it even has transformed module for interstellar flight. Blastoff rubbed his hands. Oh, thank you, Primus. Onslaught looked at the other three in CR chambers. So I presume you can transform? What about combining? Starscream nodded and waved a hand out. But of course! We already had Slindle get outgated. All you have to do is a simple laser core transplant on you four as a test. By this time tomorrow, the combatant cars will be reborn, and Bruticus shall live again! Whew, never expected to ever speak Starscream that long. How did that one guy do it? Sergeant Jack Robbins, Corporal Jack Kowalski, Private Jose Hernandez, and Private Ronco stood in attention at the White House's press room. At a podium in front of members of press corps and their family was President Abernathy. When word came to Fort Bulwark about the barrier, Sergeant Robbins and his tank crew were cut off from the United States, from Earth itself. It would have been easy for them to do nothing. Instead, given a chance, they jumped at the opportunity to lead a strike force of our equestrian allies deep into the heart of Neo Equestria itself. Their actions proved vile to their ultimate defeat. All Americans and all of humanity's ideals of this will defend. With that, he walked away from the podium and was walked over to stand by the floor. A pair of officers walked over to the table holding medals. The first one held each one up, presenting it to the press before handing it to President Abernathy. The other walked up to a smaller podium in the back and leaned it close to a microphone. The President of the United States, in the name of Congress, takes pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor to Sergeant Jack Roberts, Corporal Jan Kowalski, President Jose Hernandez, and Private John Rankos of the United States Army for conspiracy gallantry. Jack Barry kept track of the speech. At the end, he felt the medal being placed around his neck by the President. He caught a glimpse of his family, his mother and father and siblings in the crowd. Then the President was there, extending his hands toward him. His brain fried, and remembered to shake his hand before firing off the snappiest salute of his career, past or future. Clayton moved down the line, shaking the hand of each of Jack's teammates and returning their salutes. He eventually made his way back to the podium. We have drinks and refreshments in the adjoining room. He smiled. I heard the food's pretty good. Might hit three stars on Yelp. Jack and his tank crew to a circle near one of the back walls. Three of them held up glasses of champagne, while Ragnos filled up one with root punts. Perhaps of friends, Jack said, holding his glass out. The heirs clicked their glasses with his. To absent friends, they repeated before taking a sip. Jant looked down and gently touched the mill of iron hanging from her neck. I still can't lie. I'm still waiting to wake up at Fort Bulwark and realize this whole entire thing was some insane dream brought on by too much of that rainbow colored sire they had there. Her eyes crossed. I'm still trying to figure out how they got the colors to separate like that. Jose opened his mouth, but stopped before speaking, and merely shook his head. Rankos grinned. I believe it's some sort of earth pony magic. But don't quote me on that. The sire is compatible with my biology, so I did impede some of it. His cheek fins bristled. How do you humans do it? Jose grinned and lightly puts him in the eye. Ah, my friend. It's the thing your telaki and biology prevents you from sampling a most fine yokerhood. A fine whisky is one of life's pleasures. Can't let you, Jack. No. It's the same G.I. Joe was disbanded, Sergeant. After what we pulled, I wouldn't have been surprised if you got a call from them to join up. Jack laid back slightly. He looked to the ceiling, eyes focusing for a moment. You... you think so, Corporal? Smell slowly starts with a smile. But Joe, you think so? Jack nodded. I do indeed, Sergeant. So saying, he leaned forward. 
The only problem would be picking a cool name. Jack smart side. <sighs> yeah, true. Coming up with something original and badass sounding isn't easy. Some of those code names got downright silly at the end. I mean, Captain Gridiron? He started and shook his head. <laughs> I mean, what would you choose as your code name, Hernandez? I'll say Sprout Fired. What do you mean? His head darted back and forth. What's, what's about to me? Jack shrugged. Well, I need my crank crew there. I can't drive a tank and fire the main gun by myself. She yeah, shook her head. Well, what they call the assistants again? She sat her finger. Green shirts. Probably be green shirts. Right, because she sends sh sh flaming. What are the red shirts? They drive by the drove in the old Star Trek series. Well, Dan and Jose started talking. Jack simply looked to the ceiling, lost a bit of thought. Me? G.I. Joe? <laughs> Maybe. He shook his head. Yeah. Green sat at his desk in the old office. Things had calmed down considerably compared to a few weeks ago. But it was still high for activity. Right now, General Hollingsworth sat on the other side of his desk, while Vice President Alexis Thai Thang sat next to Hollingsworth's left. Right behind him stood his team for aid, Philip Profoss, the pad in hand, and Scrooge's president on his face. The main view screen was active. The image was out of the area around the Rainbow Bridge. In the foreground stood two men. One standing on the left was a man in his mid 40s, wearing a United States Army uniform. The square red and white castle insignia of the Army Corps of Engineers was visible on his shoulder. The one on the right was older, with black hair giving away to dark gray and black, wrinkled skin. He wore civilian clothes, a lab coat, and carried a deer pad in hand. The younger man, Colonel Bryce McKenzie, gestured to the area behind him. Constructicon vehicles rolled along. Dump trucks drove up to the edge of the cray air beneath the rains and unloaded tons of dirt in a non-stop convoy. Well, Mr. President, the good news is the crater dug out by General Plan 24 it wasn't nearly as deep as we thought it'd be. Maybe 8 meters the deepest spot. We're looking to rebuild basic utilities in the underground first, before moving on to homes and businesses. Clayton slowly nodded. That jives with what I observed during my first visit there, Colonel. Thank you. Is there any change to the timetable of rebuilding? Price took a said, At the moment, no. Lizzie spoke. What is the condition of the Rainbow Bridge and space time in general around there? Professor Maxwell Jones glanced at the DMPAD's hand. Well, Madam President, the Rainbow Bridge is fine. The air shot can and bombardment didn't affect it at all. He turned away to hand the air. According to our scanners, space time itself seems to be knitting itself together after Neo Equestria's incursion. I'm not entirely sure on that. Dr. Hose from Equestria should be stopping by tomorrow to give my team and I a hand, or rather, hoof with that. Think of Neo Equestria, the doctor became devalued. Delay nine. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll be in touch. He tapped a control panel on his desk, and the image changed to the Great Seal of the United States. Blessed be our founding fathers. Ow! Oh, a freaking purge reference! We are losing our tents when it comes to these jokes. Shut up, Trix! At least the Hollywood film likes to see her tone. Well, it seems to be going about as well as it can. Let's just tell us out of breath. Is staring everything that happened? Yeah. You two will sure as hell pull it out of the fire. I sort of went to her. We do know a pro, Madam First President. You were an all right. Conveying preparation the exodus, I believe. Lysa shrugged. Yeah. Same news me as trying to spin it as do nothing thy thing or some shit like that. Lane's eyes narrowed. Let me guess. Coyote News Network? Alexis nodded. He looked back. Bill, that interview I had with them two days from now? Cancel it. Phil smiled as he tapped his data pad. Consider it cancelled, Mr. President. He got up. Oh, you have an appointment with Sir Defense Keller in about five minutes. Holly's words fresh and bright. He turned to look up at Phil. Oh, Joe's coming in? Good. Lace is not going away. Lace just chuckled. Oh, oh, come on, General. You only mellowed out a lot after that trip to a question you took back in, what was it, October of 11? The Oval Office's door was open. Agent Smith stepped in, followed by an older man with short white hair and a perpetually intense expression on his face. Mr. President, Secretary of Defense Keller's here to see you, Agent Smith announced. Clayton, Hollysworth, and Alexis all stood. Clayton extended his hand. 
John, good to see you, he said, smiling. Keller took the hand and shook it. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, Joe Collinsworth, he said, nodding to each in turn. We'll get right to it. We just suffered a Class 7 incursion. Probably the worst danger Earth's been in since the last puss in 2007, five years ago. Now we managed to beat off those alternate Italian Equestrians. With help, Alexa said. Karen nodded to her. Yes, with help. And I'm damn grateful for what we got. This might even turn out to be a minor blessing in disguise. It's highlighted one area the United States and Earth Defense Command's overall neglected. Always were from this kid. Magic. Karen sighed. We have an expert of magic. We did some research on that dragon mound in England. There are some magic weapons back from the realm. Woo! DD reference. But overall, our understanding of magic or thermic based energy, or whatever the hell you want to call it, is pretty damn limited. It nearly cost us big time here. Clayton leaned forward. What are you suggesting, John? Hell, I looked at the window behind Clayton, then mostly to the west. I was suggesting we ask our equestrian allies for any and all possible help they can offer us concerning magic. How to research it. How to develop our own magic. How to counter magical incursions like this in the future. Clayton slowly nodded. That's a pretty good idea, John. A damn good idea. Gerald, what do you think? Hi, Sir Sucker said. I think I'm a bit more than a little embarrassed. We didn't start on something like this soon. Let's just wave him off. We both know how hard it is to get the bureaucracy moving, General. At the very least, we are doing something about it. Clayton stood up. John, I want you to get in touch with Albert Preston and Rhodes' bio. Ask your questions for their help. Get in touch with Twilight Sparkle if you can. Coordinate with the EDC on this. Whatever it takes. I don't want to be cut flat footed if we can help it. As he spoke up, asking for anything from Twilight Sparkle might be... Problematic at the moment, so he tried to risk thoughts. There's about two days before he had to primarily cut contact with the other Clestria. I had a phone call with her assistant Spike. He says he'd be working all the way up till the end to help them out. It was barely controlled chaos at the portal connecting Neo Equestria on this, the last day of contact between the two realities. Kate had stood inside Neo Equestria, Luna inside Equestria, the two Alicorns facing each other. East was firing a wide beam of magic from their horns, doing their best to keep the portal open as soon as possible, and make it as large as possible. Why do I imagine that Neo Equestria's Luna, while nobody was looking, asked our Celestia to give her a big hug because she needed it? The yeah, Arrowheads is attracted and expanded, bolts of yellowish white energy racing along the perimeter. A line of new foals moved into Equestria slowly but steadily. A few were on hoof, but most were in wagons or carriages. Doctors and nurses moved along with them, while soldiers did their level best to maintain order keeping the line moving along. A procession of wagons, meanwhile, moved into Neo Equestria, laden with crops, farming equipment, fertilizer, potion antidote, and other assorted goods. Twilight Sparkle stood with Dr. Redheart, near a wagon laden with potion antidote. Clipboard floated in front of her. All right, this is the last pass of antidote we were able to create, she swallowed. I'm sorry we couldn't do more help, Doctor. Redheart smiled wanly. You've done all you can to help. I thank you for that. Her eyes went to the line of refugees leading the New York Equestria. And for taking in as many as you can before the end. Twice ears folded against her skull and her head drooped. It's still not enough. Redheart sighed. We didn't do enough. Or think enough when we converted this earth and its populace. Now we must do what we can. And hope Sunday we're forgiven for our actions. But Earth Pony Stallion, with a green mane, tried up to the pair. Doctor, we've got the antidote wagons all lined up and ready for your inspection. Redheart nodded to him. Thank you, Spike. Twice ears twitched. Her head slowly rose. Wait, Spike? She leaned forward, eyes widening as he took him in. Oh, oh, sweetheart, she didn't. Spike glanced at Twilight's general direction, his eyes pointedly not meeting hers. If you're referring to Disequestria's version of Twilight Sparkle, yes. She did turn me into a new foal. He stepped back and looked himself over. I thanked her for it. Once. Once. Twice shot worked for a bit. She finally reached out with a huff. I... I know how incredibly stupid this question is, but I have to ask. Are you alright? How... How are you holding up? Spike looked to his forelegs. I... missed my claws, he finally said. 
and being able to hold stuff and not able to use my mouth. You can turn around like this, TL. I don't know how to use this. Miss my fire breath, too. Twice swallowed. I don't know if the antidote will turn you back into a dragon. She quietly admitted. The brow furrowed. Although if I double tend to transmutate the sun spells with Draconic Template, probably my first of spike, I should be able to- A soldier quiet called at Twilight's side. Miss Sparkle, I have news for Princess Luna. The portal is destabilizing. We're pulling everyone back. Now. Twilight's eyes widen. A small strand of remains shot up. Oh, what? D no! No! I can't leave now! Spike needs my help! I, I have to fix this! The soldier shook her head. I'm truly sorry, Miss Sparkle, but this isn't open for negotiation. I have a direct order from Princess Luna herself. If I have to get my squad mates over here and drag your flight back to our Equestria, I will. Why stare at a soldier? You're fucking kidding me. You're not. Well, let me tell you something, Sergeant. I'm not going anywhere until I fix it so Spike turns back into a dragon. Spike crossed his twilight and the soldiers started arguing. Finally, he spoke. Twilight! Twilight Sparkle! He waited for her to turn and face him. Go. I don't want to be responsible for you being stranded here. He forced a smile. I'll be alright. Red Hot's here, after all. That's why I stared at him. But, but I have to fix this. Spike shook his head. No. You have to deliver a message for me. To the Twilight Sparkle I knew. He sucked in a breath. Tell her. Tell her I forgive her. Tell her I forgive her it's alright. Can you please do that for me? Oh, that's gonna hurt her! Red Heart spoke up. Twilight, it's alright. Our lunacy and kings have a plan. It's a long shot, but it just might work. She pointed to a portal, which began to bend and flap in a non existent breeze. You have to go. Twilight stared at Spike and looked at Red Heart. Finally, she crossed herself. Cross my heart, hope the fly stick a cookie in my eye. She chatted out. She looked to the soldier. I'm sorry for my outburst, Sergeant. She spared one last look at Spike and Redheart before following the soldier out of the Equestria and back to her home country. Keynes eventually made her way back to the portal to Equestria proper. She and Luna looked across time and space, her eyes never wavering as they slowly closed the portal. I'm sorry we couldn't do more. Keynes said before the portal was still shut. Redheart let out a breath. It's up to us now. Luna swallowed the unfamiliar and, quite frankly, alien surroundings she and Keynes found herself in. It was the Prince of the Ark, the starship that had brought Nemesis Prime and his army of Autobots to what was Earth, now the Equestria. Now, the three remaining Autobots under Nemesis' command worked around the bridge, opening up panels, working on controls, and various other tasks. Kane spoke up. How much longer? One of the Autobots, Sideswipe, stomped over and jabbed a finger at Kane's. Oh, we're doing the best we could, he can, he snarled out. There's already three of us. We're not even sure if Cybertron still exists. What a nod. We understand. Still, if you try to take us, the conquest will be most unpleasant for you three. Sights like Clans there. We know. He tapped his chest. But we owe you at least for taking us in and get rid of those bombs in our chests. One of the other robots, Wheeljack, stood up from kneeling right below the main view screen. Okay, we're set to transmit, he said, closing a panel. Sideswipe walked over to the command chair and pressed a few buttons on the armrest. A low humming was surrounded out. The lights dimmed slightly. He leaned in close to a speaker grill embedded on the armrest. This is Cyberswipe calling Cybertron. Come in! This is Sideswipe calling Cybertron. Come in, please! Optimus Prime is dead, as are almost all the other Autobots. We're calling on a missile of mercy. Silence was their only answer. When it flew up and over to Sideswipe's side, he floated down close to the speaker grill. Attention, Cybertron! My name is Princess Luna. Everything Sideswipe said is true. We are in dire need of any assistance that you may be able to provide. I beg of you to help, if you're out there. A burst of static came over the speakers. The main view screen flickered and brightened. The rough silhouette of a humanoid's upper body form. Hello! This is Air Commander Starscream under the Decepticon Defense Fleet. Nemus said, finally clearing up and showing the white head, silver face of Starscream. His optic sensors glanced to his left. And I presume the equine to be Princess Luna. Fascinating! Luna flew over to the view screen, stopping and hovering a few feet in front of it. She bowed her head. I am Air Commander. He lost it to a brief description of the events, concerning the conferences of the previous Earth. 
of her sister's ascended to madness, and is situated in the new falls. Our intentions were noble, but our methods were misguided at best. Please, if there's anything I, you can do, I will. The image on the few screen widened. A narrow Decepticon stepped into view. This one slightly larger than the star screen. He carried a noble being and a large fusion cannon on his right arm. Of course! You can't have the Decepticons without Megatron showing up at least once. This isn't done. It's a Zuna. I am Megatron, Decepticon Commander. You thought this like green chest. I hear your plea. Let us do everything in my power to help. He went to a slap. Starscream, ready your squadron of ships to fly to Neo Equestria's coordinates. Take whatever you deem necessary. Just help them out. Starscream now sat to attention. Of the Lord's Lord, Megatron. Help us on the way. With that, he turned and ran out. Megatron leaned in close. Ah, uh, sights like we attack in Windshotter, I see. I will integrate you through your partner in exchange for aid and help you out in this crisis. Sideswipe held his arms up. Hey, no problem. We'll take it, right, guys? Bill Tech nine. P yeah, I'm crazy, not stupid. Near back, the pink colored wind charger stepped forward. We'll do whatever you want, Megatron. Megatron focused once more on Luna. Starscream will be there as soon as possible, Princess. My only regret is that we could not be there to aid you now. No matter what, I love Megatron. Yes. Luna bowed her head. It's still more than we could have for Megatron. Thank you. It was a solemn and mostly silent procession through the dungeons below Canterlot Castle. Four guards ponies escorted the former Queen Celestia down the narrow, torch lit halls, through checkpoints, and finally down a lower corridor lined with jail cells. Through it all, Queen Celestia remained silent, her head hung low, eyes locked on the floor in front of her chipped hooves. Her mane drooped down, messy, untidy, and solid. Tiny nose at her flank were all that was once left of majestic wings. The barest hint of a stump on her forehead was the only indication of a horn once being there. Worst of all, her cutie mark was little more than a smudge on her flank. Her dark yellow patch of fur that, if one squinted, might be able to discern was the sun. Oh my god, not only did the elements basically wipe out her magic, it wiped out her soul! Guards finally let her past cells occupied by the former Elements of Harmony. AJ, Pinky, Fluttershy, and Dash and their cells barely moving. Verity was on her cot, every loose piece of material piled in front of her. Shining armor snapped to attention as she passed. And finally, there was Twilight. The rest of her cell, four lights reaching out. Queen Celestia! She cried out, I have a plan to get us out, and a nectar plan. I just need two spoons and a bowl of oatmeal. I'm sure we can win this time. Queen Celestia paid her no mind. She was led to the last cell in the hall. The door was open, and she walked inside. She turned to face the guards, who regarded her with expressions of pity, scorn, or plain sadness. The cell door was closed, but as the bar slid past, a beam formed in front of Queen Celestia's muzzle. It, he... Had a long serpentine body, four mismatched limbs, a long face, a single horn jutting from his head, and piercing yellow eyes. His cord slithered through the air. Oh, Celestia, he sketched the bow. How the mighty have fallen. Queen Celestia's eyes started twitching. A breath hits a float. She whispered. This card grinned. He floated over to her left ear and leaned in close. Don't bother shouting. No one can hear or see or even sense me. No one but you, that is. He drew his head back and shook his head. Oh, if only I could have met my counterpart. I would have shook his paw and brought him a drink or something. Queen Celestia slowly shook her head. How? Oh. This guard shrugged. I broke free about a week ago. Placed a statue, kept low, scattered things out. He held his vulture's paw and looked around. I may have been aware while petrified, but there's surprisingly little you could see from Candlelight Royal Garden. Celestia's eyes widened. No. 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 He grunted the limbs together and smirked. And now I'm free. Thank you so much for the entertainment, Sully. But I think it's time for me to make my own fun. He held the lion's pill. Try not to miss me too much. He snapped his fingers and vanished. Celestia's cries echoed throughout the dungeon. For the rest of the night. Well. 
End of thick. Review time, folks! But, do I really need to say anything here, guys? I mean, come on. RK Striker is a popular person on this channel. He has done, so far, several great fanfics, and a lot of these fics are a high rank. We all know he's a classic. We all know he's done some great stories, so do I really need to say my viewpoints on this? I don't think I do. So, instead I'll just say everything I love. I love the use of the Autobots who stole the show here. I love how this led to the serious repercussions of what would happen to Neo Equestria and taking in 7 billion humans. I love to show that it wasn't going to be perfectly happy at the end. And I love how the main six battled not with a fist fight, but a battle of wills and minds and ideals. Well, I think it's about time we took a break from Epic War Pieces for a bit, shall we? Let's play some games. Your move. See you next time.